Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Emerging Pod, where we get emerging people into emerging careers. Today's guest is Tim Cordingly, data scientist at an autonomous vehicle startup, Wave. Tim studied engineering at Durham University, where he did an internship with Jaguar Land Rover before landing his first role as an associate consultant at KPMG. He, th he then transitioned into the world of data science, working at Deliveroo, and now he's back into the automotive space with Wave. Tim, good to have you. Yeah, thanks, guys. Pleasure, pleasure to be on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's awesome to have you here. Uh, so before the before you joined the the world of data science, you were um, an avid engineer. You studied general engineering at Durham. Um, what made you cho choose that? Um, I'll be honest. I kind of like fell into engineering. Um, so as a kid, um, I always kind of liked building stuff. Right? It's a bit of a cliche, I know, but like you know, Lego, Meccano, this kind of stuff. And I actually didn't really have like an active view of what I wanted to do at university. Um, so I kind of, I guess, hedged my bets. So I did like the international baccalaureate at the IB. Um, so I ended up basically taking like physics, chemistry and maths, um, as well as like Spanish, um, English and like, um, like effectively um, other, other languages as like a standard. And effectively I just fell into like engineering. Um, so obviously then did engineering at Durham. Um, did two years of general and then specialized into mechanical um, and kind of it, it was interesting I did those kind of internships at JLR as you said um, and then eventually I was like well actually I'd quite like to kind of keep my, my options even further open um, and so actually ended up joining kind of KPMG um, as opposed to taking kind of a, a follow-up job offer with um, Jaguar Land Rover. What was that um, transition like from, from education into employment? Did you know exactly what you wanted to do or did you just want to choose something a bit more generalist to try, try your hand at a, a number of different things and see what you like further? Yeah, I absolutely had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, so at, at university, I mean, up until honestly, like kind of, I guess, for a year, a year till I graduated, I didn't actually know what the big four were or what KPMG was, for example, right? Um, so I think one of the big things was like, I actually don't know what I want to do at this point. So I will actively try and keep the options open. Um, and so joining kind of, you know, a consulting grad scheme, um, where you get the variety of experience, um, I think was, was kind of helpful and continue to keep those options open. And then obviously once you go into the working world, you start to kind of see technologies you find interesting or see companies you find interesting. Um, and from there, I think you stand a better chance of, of working out you know, exactly where you want to go. And that's, to be fair, how I kind of ended up moving then from um, KPMG into um, Deliveroo um, and business analytics and data science. What was like an interesting project you worked on when you were at KPMG? Um, I think the, so at KPMG, like I basically was first exposed to kind of SQL um, in like a, you know, work setting in terms of actual like adding tangible value as opposed to like purely theoretical. Um, and so I think the very first project I did where I was kind of introduced to SQL um, stands out to me because I had absolutely no idea what was going on, I'll be honest, right? right. Um, I think is a, is a common experience when someone sees a new language the first time, whether that's kind of a, a spoken language or kind of a coding language, um, and everyone goes through it. Um, so being exposed to that and obviously working as part of a broader team with kind of SQL experts was really interesting. Um, the the kind of... the the project itself was was with kind of a big pharmaceutical company and um, we're basically like reconciling their kind of accounts in SQL more or less um and so kind of the first week was very daunting and the second week was slightly less daunting and then you know as you became more familiar with it you understood what things were doing yeah kind of like um that learning curve was almost exponential um, and I, I raise that to say that you know even now if you see something that's brand new you're probably going to have a similar reaction right um, but knowing that you've done it before um, is very helpful to be able to overcome that kind of um, initial kind of, I guess, fear effectively. That makes sense. And then you, how did you find uh, your next role at Deliveroo and with that transition into more of a proper data science role? Yeah, so um, like I said, I was kind of exposed to like, these sorts of technologies and, you know, the, I guess the beginnings of um, big data and back then kind of what kind of six, seven years ago, almost like 
data science, the concept was starting to coalesce. Obviously, even today, you kind of talk to five different people what data science means to them. You probably get five different kind of responses, right? It's a very broad discipline. Um, but back then, it was kind of starting to coalesce and like the, the term was effectively becoming like trendy, right? Um, so I was fortunate enough to know one of the cohort above me at KPMG. He had actually moved on to deliver him into this kind of initially business analytics team. Um, so I was lucky enough to, be able to kind of talk to him about, hey, like what are the projects you're working on, what technologies you're using, um, what what is the company like? Um, sound interesting. So I then moved across. Um, I was fortunate enough to get a position, um, and that was that was really interesting, right? Because that was you know going into having used like SQL on you know maybe a project basis at KPMG to kind of using it daily, right? Um, to kind of write pipelines, to do analysis. Um, so it becomes kind of like your bread and butter, um, and it was really interesting to see that applied across all facets of the business right so operations commercial even strategy um it was it was really interesting to see that um kind of the impact effectively fairly straightforward um like data analysis can have um but then also kind of you know work with the commercial partners the operational partners to get their kind of um interpretation of situations as well right um so i mean data science is really operating a vacuum right you are always operating with the intention of you know, trying to help the team or the business make better decisions in a more robust manner. Um, and it was it was really cool to see that really for the first time um, in action. Right? How uh, well developed was data science at Deliveroo? Were the teams, was there a big team, first of all, and was it well formalized? Yeah, so it was, um, I mean, I think to this day, Deliveroo has one of the biggest data science teams in Europe. Um, back then, there were kind of, um, when I joined, I joined like a business analytics team um, and then there was a separate data science team, which then within kind of about, you know, six to 12 months basically merged into one wider um, data science team as they were effectively doing quite similar things. Um, so, yeah, it's a big team. Um, I have to say everyone was really friendly. I obviously kind of learned, I guess, effectively earned my chops, data science chops at Deliveroo. Um, so eternally grateful for, for all the people there who kind of supported me. Um and I think to this day is a really great place to work. Some really interesting problems, right? Um, you know, across obviously the business itself, you know, has an operational component, has a marketing component, has an ad component, um, kind of has a optimized profitability component, has a pricing component. So almost everywhere you look, um, there were, and I'm, I'm sure still are, very interesting problems that can be kind of tackled and improved um, with data science. And did you work across all the problems or did you specialize in in a specific area yeah no i I wish um so i started out in kind of (laughs) operations um so that was a lot of effectively like hey how do we make the the rider experience and the the efficiency for riders and the kind of um the amount of money they're able to earn like how do we make that as 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 good as possible right for all the parties involved um and then i moved on to kind of customer care um which was about you know effectively you know as and when things did go wrong in delivery room, like what is what is our approach and how can we make that kind of recovery experience as, as good as possible, right, to try and keep customers on the platform. Um, so that involves things like, hey, trying to understand what's the best compensation policy to set, um, where do we kind of push a little bit harder, where can we be a little bit more kind of flexible, um, you know, how many agents do we need, um, where do we need to staff them, all these sorts of things. What 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 does good service look like, right, you know, how is it kind of a chatbot based approach? Is it kind of actually going straight to an agent and obviously the associated costs? Um, so a really interesting, um, both kind of have like operational um, foundations, but both really interesting areas um, to work in. Was there a specific moment in time where you faced some kind of a crisis um, that kind of kept you up all night? Um, I mean, there, there were there are probably a, a couple. I mean, in in an environment where you effectively have a um, production app, right, and any small downtime, yeah. particularly at kind of key periods such as like lunch or dinner, um, where any small kind of downtime or perhaps like uh, untested PR that gets merged that might change and then certain policies, for example, those can have very big impact. It might not be at a customer level particularly large, but when you multiply by thousands or hundreds of thousands of customers, right? obviously the impact of the business can be uh, quite large. So we did have a couple. Um, they were generally sorted pretty quickly. Um, but I, I think it is, it's it's common in, in most large companies. And obviously, as you can mature, um, you become increasingly good at kind of 
adding the safety net, the kind of Swiss cheese layers of protection to prevent those from happening. Mm, that's very interesting. How did uh, the Deliveroo team grow whilst, whilst you were there? How did you see that transition? Yeah, so I mean, I, I, to be fair, I might get the, the number slightly wrong here, but it effectively doubled from when I joined um, to when I left kind of three years right. later. And obviously in that period, you know, went through various kind of market openings, various market consolidations. Obviously a big event was like the IPO, the, the company went public, which is really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and so the data science team itself obviously grew grew massively as well. I think we, we must have almost doubled or tripled in size. I think when I left, the, the, the team size was about 150 data scientists, which is you know pr pretty vast by data science um, team standards. But still, kind of there was almost still there weren't enough people to do the things that were being asked. Right, like I say, like um, the the kind of the general feature experimentation, algorithmic development, um, general analytics. Um, I guess the, the the business intelligence, the context sharing, all of that kind of lay on the shoulders of data science to to a, a varying degree um and so there were you know there was always demand for data science work um, which was good right um there's there's always, there's always interesting stuff to kind of get stuck into that's uh the definition of a data-driven company <laughs> yeah no I, i was i will say to deliver his credit it was it was very data-driven um it was it was firmly embedded throughout the business which is great to see Uh, I'm curious, how did you, so coming from KPMG and applying for the role, how did you kind of pitch yourself in this new space, business analytics? How far was it from what you've done before? Yeah, so it's, it's a really good question, actually. I think, I mean, a theme I've seen is that um, in my relatively limited experience that the first job, the KPMG job was kind of almost the hardest to get. You had to go through the most hurdles, the psychometric tests, the on-site And that kind of makes sense, right? There are just a huge quantity of candidates coming through. So they need need some way of kind of filtering through. Um, and then it like, gets kind of easier after that. Um, but yeah, a lot of it was like kind of being quite honest about it. It was like, look, hey, I have this experience. I'm fortunate to have, you know, worked on financial modeling across various different kind of client companies. Um, I have experience with SQL. I have experience with Python. Um, I'm not going to know it all, right? But that's that's kind of that was the expectation on both sides as well, um, um, mm. and effectively going going into the whole process um, with with that kind of honesty, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So to give an example, um, I had effectively no like A/B testing experience right when I applied um, to join that team, um, and one of the sections of the take home test was like you know interpreting A/B. Um, experimental results and i was like hey well i can give it a go but i'm probably going to get this wrong um but it's, it's that kind of like openness but at the same time right you also then have to kind of actively show that you are where you, you think you have weaknesses you are going out to try and fill them right so i'd be like i had done a couple of like kind of side projects in python scraping these kind of things just to kind of give myself a little bit of like real world experience um on a technology that i hadn't used as much as like sql for example in my kind of day-to-day -day at kpmg Yeah, that makes sense. One of our guests, uh, Andy McMahon, uh, said that uh, the best is usually he found the better success applying for a job that he felt like he wasn't necessarily 100% ready for. But that was actually what gave you the most uh, satisfied, the most reward, basically, in the next move that give you the challenge that you need to grow. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think there's also something to be said about like, hey, if you don't think you can get the job, you're probably going into those interviews with less pressure on your shoulders, right? Um, and I think that's that's a big part of it as well, right? Like interview processes are daunting. So, you know, if you can find a way to take the pressure off yourself um, without going like totally like maverick and off script, then I think that's always helpful. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and then the your current role now at Wave, how did that opportunity come about? Um, so so the, the kind of data science team um at wave is, is relatively new it's kind of you know about a year and a half old effectively or just under two years old um and actually it was founded by you know one of uh, the guys i used to work with um, at delivery um so he, he was like spinning up this team and he reached out he's like hey is this something you might be interested in um and i was like you know actually, I, I, look i'll be honest i'd never heard of wave until he reached out right um but then i was like hey actually this is this is pretty cool i mean 
the, the approach that Wave is taking um, is, is different to kind of um, existing kind of incumbents of the industry, which is, you know, appealing. I also just think like that, you know, self-driving as a concept is probably one of the great generational kind of challenges of our time. And I was like, hey, if, if I'm going to make this jump, um, perhaps from a more established company to a kind of startup, this is probably the time to do it. Um, so I kind of, he reached out. Um, I was like, this seemed interesting. I went through the application process. Um, again, was, was fortunate enough to get the job. Um, and, you know, here I am kind of a, a year and a few months later, basically. Uh, can you just tell a bit uh, about Wave, what they do, and describe a bit what their approach is and how it's different from com- from what companies do in the AV space? Yeah, sure. So uh, Wave, um, we're effectively kind of pioneering what we call AV 2.0. Um, so... For con like for comparison, AV 1.0 is an approach taken by you know big incumbents, um, and their approach is basically to you know apply you know very heavy sensor stacks, so lots of radar, lots of kind of lidar, lots of cameras, quite expensive, um, hand engineered systems, um, and then HD maps, right? Um, and they they have to be fair shown pretty good success in the areas they operate, um, but what we think is a kind of limitation is that it's not particularly scalable or generalizable, right? So if you want to move to a new city or if you want to move to a kind of um, additional vehicle platform, you basically have to repeat that entire process. It's kind of very kind of um, cost intensive um, and effectively not that scalable. So kind of our kind of bet is that AV 2.0 is um, effectively replacing, uh, you know, the hand coded systems, the HD maps with a kind of end to end deep model, right? Um, and so intuitively what we're doing is we're basically feeding lots of expert driving data um, by a process called like imitation learning into a deep neural net. Um, and that net is basically learning to drive as you or I might drive, you know, in a driving school or like for a dri- driving exam, right? You see what is being done and you learn the kind of from that kind of expert data and then you kind of learn to extrapolate to new situations. Um, and so it's, it's pretty interesting, right? Because we've, we've shown that kind of this approach does actually um, generalize and um, so we've we've shown that you know training um, a model only on london data um, can then go and drive on unseen roads in places like kind of cambridge um, leeds and manchester right so obviously different roads unseen roads also different um, driving cultures i mean if you've driven in london you know it <laughs> can be a little bit hectic at times right so one of our, our bets as well is that hey if you can drive in london you, you can probably do it in most places um so that's the, that, that's the first one that kind of that we've kind of proof of concept so the generalizing and the second is you know generalizing to new vehicle platforms um so we've shown that you know we've trained uh, a model um, on ipace data which is kind of a, a smaller vehicle um, and we then had that model with a bit of additional training data but not a huge amount um drive successfully on kind of a, a small commercial van right? like a grocery delivery van um so that's kind of our bet right which is that you know we can th- this approach will help us scale and generalize much more quickly um, and we think that that will ultimately help us get to kind of a hundred cities deployed um, first, right? Um, so a, a really interesting approach, and kind of you know some some really interesting results that we've already seen. No, oh, that's that's pretty interesting. And do you does Wave uh, manufacture cars, or do you mainly provide the technology that say any manufacturer can put on top of their car and use to make themselves drive? Yeah. In? So at, at, at the moment, we don't um, we, we don't produce the vehicles. We kind of we bring them in and retrofit them with our effectively like our, our technology stack. Okay, makes sense. And when you you joined the team, how many? Uh, how big was the team? Uh, so when I joined Wave about a year and a bit ago, I also joined at a very strange time. I kind of joined between like Christmas and New Year, so I, I was like the only one in the office and dragging everyone else in. So I, I felt a bit bad about that. So um, apologies to those, those who were there who were listening. Um, but yeah, it was about kind of, uh, it was about half the size um, it was today. Um, and we, we kind of continue to grow um, as, as we kind of try and tackle um, all these different challenges and bets, right? So how did you find, or like, what, did, what have you learned from maybe your, your time at Deliveroo that you've, you've taken on, you've, try to instill here in the team being there early you get to have a i guess a big impact on like the data culture and even the product itself yeah so i think <clears throat> the first thing i say is that you know so when i first joined kpmg even going, going back further like 
perhaps coming in naive to the workforce, I'm like, hey, like, I'm sure all these big companies have everything sorted, right? They do everything really well. And then you go in, you're like, actually, they don't, right? That's, that's the big secret. Um, but what they do have, and delivery was the same, um, is you have these really strong processes, which sometimes might be great, but then you start to realize, hey, these processes are here for a reason. We have these, you know, catch-ups or we have these kind of uh, you know, decision-making processes or these kind of strategic processes. Um, and you start to pick up on those. And those are the things really, I think, that are really helpful. So again, we kind of mentioned that delivery was like really heavily data-driven. Um, so kind of carrying that approach across into Wave um, has been really helpful. Um, and it's something I think we've, we've seen quite good success with. So, you know, every part of the business, and there are lots of parts of the business in Wave, right? There's kind of the, the, the net itself, the neural net, um, there's development, there's the kind of robot, there's the controller, um, there's the kind of hardware, the software. So there's lots of kind of parts to the kind of autonomous vehicle stack apart from just the model itself, right? Um, and so what we're trying to do is say, hey, where do we have blind spots in terms of, you know, actual metric coverage? Like, what are we aiming for? And then how do we decompose that kind of North Star metric into the various parts of the AV stack? And then, hey, can we measure what good looks like on a team level? And then we can cascade that up and down and start to work out, you know, where we're doing really well or perhaps where we need a little bit more um, development. And you can kind of carry that process across a business, right? So, you know, we always have a very strong operational team for actually taking the vehicles out and, and testing on the road, like a really core cool part of what we do, collecting the data, but obviously testing it as well. Um, we can we can cover that with metrics and work out, hey, you know, what do we need to improve on again and where, where do we need, um, you know, perhaps more support? Um, I think un until you actually can start measuring something, it's very difficult to make any sort of decision off the back of it, right? It might be the case that it's doing really well, but, you know, it also might be the case that it's not. So um, it's, it's, it's not, I think, in everyone's best interest to kind of bury heads in the sand. It's always best to kind of get that visibility and acknowledge that it might not be perfect initially and then kind of work from there. Yeah, absolutely. You can't improve what you can't measure. Um, and do you remember actually the first time you uh, uh, went into one of the wave car and let it drive you? Uh, yeah, I do actually. Um, it's it was it was a very cool experience, I have to say. And I, I've been I've been in it over kind of several times over the last year, um, and it's really cool to see how how much it's improved, right? Um, yeah. So we we kind of we we, we run tests around um, around the office, um, obviously with a safety driver in the vehicle, right? And um, to kind of take over if if it looks like it's going to make a kind of um, an incorrect decision, for example. Um, but it is a very cool experience, I, I will say. I mean, obviously, that's the first time I've ever been in kind of you know, a self-driving car. Um, and I, I was very impressed. Um, it is kind of, the, it, it's, it's the tangible moment, right, when you get in it, starts driving you around, and it's kind of doing really complicated, like, unprotected turns. Um, it's kind of overtaking, like, stationary buses. You're like, hey, actually, like, you know, but the future is nearly here kind of thing, right? Um, it, is, it, is, it is very cool. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, would would recommend it to anyone who can who can do it. Was that through London? Uh, yeah, so it was just a kind of route, um, basically around the office. So uh, for, for for context, um, our HQ is up in Kings Cross in North London, um, and again, okay. I mean, they are, are arguably kind of North London driving is possibly worse than the rest of London's driving, right? Or more hectic. Um, but we basically just take it around, take it around the roads. So if you're familiar with like Caledonian Road, for example, up, up towards kind of like uh, the Emirates, the Arsenal football stadium. Um, so yeah, very cool. Yeah, definitely a busy area to let yourself be driven by, by a car. And, um, so you mentioned the, that you get training data from professional drivers. What kind of data is that? Do you, just install cameras on um, taxis or um, fleets of vehicles, or how, how does that process look like? Yeah, so uh, we obviously have an internal fleet, like a development fleet. Um, mm -hmm. And so primarily we use that. Um, so we have you know, the fleet go out every day uh, to collect you know, hours of expert driving. So we have kind of um, safety operators who are you know, really highly qualified drivers. They've kind of been like driving instructors or kind of, um, you know, uh, effectively kind of large vehicle drivers, you know. Um, and so they are, you know, they know their kind of highway code inside out and they can go out and they can drive even these difficult conditions um, as, as best we would expect a really good kind of human drive to do so. 
Um, so we can then take that data, obviously, and kind of ingest it. Um, we do also work with kind of other partners um, and have additional plans to kind of basically um, add cameras to their fleets. Um, and so we can obviously expedite kind of data capture that way. Um, so there are, there, are, there are a couple of different approaches. And a kind of more, more recent advance that we're kind of looking into is this idea of like, you know, actually, there's obviously the real world data. But mm-hmm. there's probably, well, there are certain like limitations on that in terms of cost and, you know, um, scale perhaps. Um, and so what we're looking at is like synthetic data, right? Um, so we do have um, an internal simulator, right, where we're trying to basically simulate the real world. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are other approaches we're looking at to basically generate, you know, either augment real world data with different um, kind of scenarios or just generate brand new novel scenarios, right? Um, and you might imagine if we can do that mm-hmm. offline, um, supported by kind of like big cloud computing, we can really like, expedite um, data collection, but also kind of testing, right, um, which removes a massive bottleneck for us, which is you know, really exciting. That makes sense. That's really interesting. And you mentioned scalability. How does the system scale? Do you have to work with car manufacturers to install the systems at the point of production, or can you retrofit vehicles? How does how does that look like? How is it going to grow? Um, so, I mean, at the moment, we basically just retrofit um, vehicles we buy in. Um, I think, like, full disclosure, we're probably still working on what our strategy looks like um, in terms of moving forwards. Um, but I would expect it to be some kind of some combination of, of those things, right? Um, I think I'd, ideally, we'd obviously offer in a world where we just provide the tech and the kind of like sense stack and like the, the models, and then that gets kind of either retrofitted or integrated into. Um, uh, a larger vehicle manufacturer um, as, as and when the kind of tech is at, at that maturity. Mm. Is there a specific application you look at um, that you want to focus on, such as fleets or just the wider kind of consumer segment is the goal? Yeah, so there are, I mean, there are obviously loads of kind of, I think, use cases we can think of for kind of self-driving vehicles, but some, some of the areas we're interested in um, primarily are kind of like the big ones that you see other kind of incumbents focus on um, are kind of grocery delivery and like ride hailing, for example, right? Um, mm-hmm. So so grocery delivery, we have we have engaged with partners um, and we are kind of, you know, testing out our tech um, in, in collaboration with them, which is really exciting. Um, and obviously that would help us kind of flush out, you know, any, any, any issues and also help us to kind of um, basically improve the product, right? I think a, a big thing here is that, like obviously there is there are almost three pillars right there, obviously the, the product itself the self-driving capability of the tech has to has to be there we also need the legislation right so in the uk for example at the moment um there isn't it's a little bit of a gray area there you, you can't actually go fully driverless right so we are working with the government to work out what that looks like um and obviously everyone's kind of doing this for the first time right so we're all kind of working together to work out what that kind of rule book needs to look like what what is safe um, what is what is good for the kind of and customer and the third is obviously kind of the the actual partners themselves right we need we need willing um partners to engage with us early in the process and um, to help us develop the tech um, so again like these these three moving parts all kind of need to happen um at the same time otherwise you might imagine hey we have a really great self-driving car but no one wants to actually use it as a product right there's, there's no market for it right um so it's 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 interesting it's not just kind of the the, the technology challenge but there's also kind of the legal the legislation, the kind of commercial side of it as well. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. Of the three pillars that you just mentioned, which one do you think is the the biggest bottleneck uh, that's kind of holding everything else behind? Um, it, it's hard to say, really. I mean, I think ev- everything kind of moves together, um, not necessarily in lockstep, but um, mm. like arguably, obviously, the the product, the performance, of the product needs to be there, but. Um, we're seeing the kind of um, improvement trajectory start to form anyway. Um, so not necessarily any any of those three specifically as a bottleneck, um, but you know it just remains to be seen. That I, I think you have to have all three to some degree eventually, right, to have a, a kind of mm-hmm. commercially viable product. Um, and so we just need to wait and see where that lands in kind of one or two years' time, right? Um, so Wave recently, actually last year, I think, you guys raised uh, a huge Series B. I think it was about 200 million, right? Um, what have you seen change since? Uh, so what has that money helped the company achieve since? And how is that um, looking further? 
Yeah, so I mean, I, I think it's really just helped us kind of double down on like some of the bets we have, right? Um, so if you think that, you know, where Wave had got to on the initial Series A and the performance of the product was, was really, really impressive. And so that money is basically just being used now to hey double down on the bets um, that we have high confidence and conviction in and bring in the, the, the talent and the really, you know, um, talented engineers and like, machine learning scientists, applied scientists, the operational people, the commercial people to go after those goals, right? Um, it, it's it, it's often a case of, you know, you can obviously do something on a shoestring, but having like dedicated teams, mm-hmm. clear strategy, a, a good runway um, makes all the difference, right? Um, so I, I don't think we've changed anything particular. It's just a case of, you know, mm-hmm. deploying that deploying that capital now to, to really double down on the, on the high conviction bets. Yeah, that makes sense. So, in terms of the team growth, how um, how are you thinking about hiring, and um, how do you assess what does good look like? Yeah, so th- this will obviously kind of vary by by team and function across across the org. But our, our general process is that you know we we obviously want you know um, talented people and also people who are like mission aligned, right? So um, people who are kind of excited by the company. Um, and, and kind of you know, excited to work on on, on these kind of uh, projects. Um, in terms of like what our kind of hiring process looks like, it's it's fairly standard um, across the company. I think um, I, I can kind of share the kind of data science process, um, and it will be for those who are kind of familiar with big tech processes, very similar to that, right? So we we, we typically have, for example, a you know initial screening interview with a recruiter. Then you'll go through to kind of a uh, initial technical interview with a hiring manager so like a data science manager for example if you're applying for data science or engineering manager if you're applying for an engineering role um, and if you get through that you then go through to kind of the on-site round which is like a loop of four interviews or three or four interviews and we'll cover things like you know stats engineering pro- or programming sorry um, system design and like a culture interview round and um, and then if if the candidate's successful there they'll go through to the final round which will generally be like an interview with their director or vp um, and then, you know, it's onto the offer stage. Um, so I think quite a, quite a familiar process um, and can be quite intense, to be fair. Like the, the, the on-site round is always, I think, quite a, a draining day if, if people have been through those before, right? Um, but we find that's generally the best way to kind of both, I guess, um, respect kind of, uh, I guess, candidate time by kind of doing it in one one fell swoop, ideally, and also kind of, you know, internal colleagues' time, right? Um, as, as interviewing does take time out of the day, not just the interview, but also kind of the, the, the follow-up, the feedback. Um, since even for candidates who are not kind of successful, we obviously want to give them feedback, right, which will help them kind of in the future. Yeah, it makes sense. How the So when have you put, uh, at what stage have you put that kind of recruitment process in place? Because I imagine maybe when you join or are very early on, especially as a startup, uh, it tends to be a lot leaner. Yeah, so I mean, again, full disclosure. So Wave was kind of founded in 2017, and I only joined like a year ago. So I mean, it's still you know, Series B, but I, I joined relatively later on. Um, so when I joined, they already had these kind of processes in place. Um, and I, I think you know, a quick note on that. I think actually a lot of the time, perhaps the kind of the, the processes around you know hiring, feedback, um, kind of pay cycles, all these things that you might take for granted for a bigger company. Um, startups sometimes do struggle with right and it can be hard to implement them mm. um, so all credit to the people who have who had put those in place um, as, it, as it kind of it, it really makes the kind of day-to-day experience you know much much more kind of enjoyable i mean Im- Im- imagine a world where like you have no structured pace cycle or review cycle right um, pre- pretty tricky right so or even no structured kind of hiring cycle right you know so all these things you might take for granted they're really really like important to kind of foundational success of the company yeah yeah if you didn't have any reviews then you would have to shout for for a pay raise and whoever shouts the loudest would end up getting it <laughs> well exactly yeah and it's like it's, it's not kind of uh, not conducive to kind of like an equitable or like a fair process right so yeah yeah indeed uh what would be your advice to to someone uh getting into the data science field whether like through a specific degree or a more general general degree, what advice would you give them? I, I'd probably say like 
understand, like I said, we, we mentioned at the start, right? Data science, uh, you know, is quite a broad topic. Um, so understand kind of, I guess, the, the subdivisions within data science and perhaps which areas, I guess, interest you the most. Is it the kind of the stat side? Is it the kind of predictive side? Um, is it kind of just the general kind of data mining side? Um, all, all these sorts of things, right? Um, and obviously, like a lot of roles will combine lots of those and um, lots of those strands. Um, so that's obviously helpful, kind of understand the specific kind of, I guess, subdisciplines um, within data science and which ones you kind of find yourself most aligned with. Um, always helpful to kind of get stuck into the actual like languages themselves that typically pop up. So, you know, SQL for just general like data manipulation. Um, you find that you can do like 80, 90% of like most of your kind of work generally um, in SQL and then kind of like Python and R, for example, for kind of, you know, the more predictive modeling stuff or perhaps more causal inference um, um, stats modeling. Um, so helpful to kind of learn it, but also actually apply that to kind of real world projects, right? Whether that's kind of just like analyzing a data set you might have um, or, you know, engaging with things like Kaggle, for example, um, or even like Dicey Tech, right? You know, the, 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 these sorts of things. Um, I think that's typically a, a, a sticking point for a lot of people. It's hard to do that, right? It's hard to find something. Hey, if you're not in that role already, um, you, know, you might be able to go through things like Data Camp, for example, but you actually need the project to kind of really reinforce the stuff you've learned and understand um, perhaps the stuff that isn't shared in like the kind of anesthetized environments of like the classroom, for example. Right? Um, so that's a big one. Um, and I mean, yeah, th I think those are, those are the two, two main ones for me. Um, and also perhaps go, go into kind of job searches with, you know, the uh, understanding that, data science roles won't always just be like 100% making predictive models, right? Even if you are like an engineer, a lot of your job will just be like cleaning data, right? So, you know, make make sure that your kind of expectations are grounded in reality. Um, <laughs> otherwise, you're kind of setting yourself up, I think, for failure, really. Yeah, that's true. And uh, I guess, how would you, or I guess, how would you advise someone to approach the domain knowledge aspect? So, because you're not going to be doing data science in vacuum, in your case, is the auto industry before that uh, is more operational at uh, Deliveroo. Um, how would you advise someone to approach these this this aspect? It, it's tricky, right? Because I mean, you you can do as much reading as you want, but sometimes you just need to be like in 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 the job. I think you don't necessarily need to get hung up on the domain expertise. So I think a lot of skills in data science effectively translate well across domains, right? Effectively, what we're doing is we're trying to basically identify problems, break them down, decompose them, and then where possible, effectively use good data and statistical modeling to kind of help make better decisions or quicker decisions, right? Uh, and I think that kind of framework, that, that toolkit really applies across any domain. Now, there'll, there'll be nuances, right, for sure. Um, like, uh, like understanding causal factors, right, for example, that will vary, like what causes you know, a mall to drive better or worse is obviously domain specific. What causes a customer to order more or less domain specific. But I think those are easier to pick up than the actual kind of the, the problem solving framework. Um, and I guess the, the causal inference toolbox, right? Um, it's, it's something I guess you see quite a lot of consulting, right? They kind of, they try to teach the, the, the break down the problem. And then, you know, that approach generally um, can be transparent to any, any sort of domain. Um, so I think that's that's what I'd say is obviously it never hurts to read up, you know, on, on the company you want to join and understand perhaps how they kind of unit economics work or what what big strategic challenges or headwinds they're facing. Um, but the ability to kind of break down a problem and then work through it um, is 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 always helpful. And to be fair, is actually a classic interview question, right? Um, so often you'll see that asked, be like, "Hey, here's a problem we have," and then the hiring manager just wants to see how the kind of candidate works through it, right? Yeah, makes sense. Oh, that's interesting. Actually, actually, yeah, I had my assumption was that you do need the domain knowledge had maybe a bigger part of the role, but the way you've put it makes sense. There, there will be some edge cases where you you really need to understand, or, or at least to draw the right conclusion, you do need to have mm -hmm. domain expertise. Uh, but realistically, as a data scientist, as a professional, the, your toolkit is being able to leverage the tools that you have and apply them to whatever domain. Um, thanks. Thanks a lot for your time team. 
is there anything else you'd like to um, to announce or share with our audience? Anything that we maybe haven't covered? No, I don't think so. Um, I mean, I think, yeah, it was a really interesting discussion. Um, I, I appreciate you guys listening to me for the better part of 40 odd minutes. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I, I think we yeah, are really interesting. Um, and you know, it, it's, it's really cool what you guys are doing um, to kind of help, help get kind of more, you know, data scientists into the workforce, right? Um, especially this idea of, you know, giving them the opportunity to engage with real world problems before, you know, it's chicken egg, isn't it? Right. Like a lot of times mm -hmm. that the, the classic complaint against interview processes is that, Hey, how can you expect me to have this experience? Because I'm applying to you to get the experience. Right. So in, in some ways, exactly. like what you guys are doing is, is kind of, you know, breaking that cycle, which is really cool. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, and yeah, thanks for joining us. This was a very interesting conversation and hopefully we can have you back. Um, maybe in a year's time or so and see the, the kind of progress that Wave has achieved. Yeah, awesome. No, thanks for having me. We'd, uh, we'd love to come back. Okay. Thanks, Tim. <laughs>